request Dr. C. M. Seat, Vice Chairman, IAPA, to present a bouquet to the Chief Guest. Thank you, sir. Society of JFK. Thank you very much, sir. <coughs> Respected Dr. S. P. Ware, Sahab, Additional Director General of Police Administration, Police Headquarters, JNK. Respected Dr. Ashok Bhan, Chairman, Indian Institute of Public Administration, JNK Regional Branch. Respected Shri Rameshwar Singh Jamal, President, Criminologist Society of JNK. Respected Shri JBS Johar, Honorary Secretary, IIPA, JNK Regional Branch. Distinguished, distinguished guests, members of the IIPA, JNK Regional Branch, ladies and gentlemen. This is my proud privilege to formally welcome you all on behalf of the Indian Institute of Public Administration, JNK Regional Branch, to this function, which assumes much importance in view of fast changing nature of crimes and criminal behaviors. The topic assigned to the distinguished speaker, understanding crime and changing criminal behaviors, the new pathways, is quite relevant to the present day situations. The nature of crime has underwent a great change and the criminals have also not only changed but gone high tech, moving ahead of investigating agencies this phenomena is prevalent not only in India, but the whole world, which due to advanced technology has reduced to a small global village. The crime today doesn't have only inter-district or interstate ramifications. It has transgressed the international boundaries and a criminal sitting thousands of miles away in some foreign country can commit crime in this country, leaving the investigating agencies high and dry. The cyber crime, including hacking, lottery scams, abuse of social network working sites, etc., identify no state boundaries, making it very difficult for the investigating agencies to counter the menace. But we cannot sit as mute spectators to face embarrassment and criticism by our own countrymen, we will have to equip ourselves to keep pace with the rapidly changing circumstances. Now, without remaining for any more time between the guest speaker and the August gathering, I would like to introduce the today's <coughs> speaker, Shri Dameshwar Singh Jamwal, originally hails from village Birpur, Samba, presently settled at Kachi Chawani, Jammu. He did his graduation from GGM Science College, Jammu in the year 1985, LLB from University of Jammu in 1988, Diploma in Criminology and Police Sciences in 1990, and Diploma in United Nations and International Understanding in 2010. Shri Jamal has been practicing law in the JNK High Court for the last about 24 years and he has also remained Deputy Advocate General of JNK for a period of three years. And at present, he is Central Government Standing Council. He started working on crime reduction programs in 1991 and he organized dozens of seminars, workshops, and lectures since then. He founded Criminologist Society of JNK in the year 2004 along with some like-minded advocates and he has been able to make the presence of this NGO felt in the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. He presented two papers in UNODC organized conference against crime and spoke in its plenary session against terrorism. He has organized meetings 
with thousands of community leaders in various districts of JNK state under a project called Project Safe JNK. He was considered and included in the panel of criminologists for the award of Stockholm Prize in Criminology, which is considered equivalent to Nobel Prize in the field of criminology. Shri Jamal has also written a book, Controlling the Mind of a Criminal, a Yogic Way. He has propounded a new crime theory which has invited a lot of attention at the international level. I request him, Rameshu Singh Jamal, to come to the podium and deliver his lecture. I, I would also request the participants not to interrupt the speaker during his talk, the one, Shri Rameshwar Singh Jamal. Assistant Director General of Police JNK, Dr. Shok Ghan, Director IAPA, Mr. JBS Johar, Honorary Secretary of IAPA, Senior Superintendent of Police, Mr. Nisar Ahmed, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Well, Nisar Sahib has uh, said a lot about my works, but I don't think that the, these are any achievements. These were small steps, small endeavors started about two decades ago in a quest to find as to whatever we do, why we do. And this was a all-encompassing endeavor which included the maladaptive or the criminal behaviors. And when I talk about criminal behaviors, I talk all about all, all sorts of criminal behaviors, be it terrorism, nationalism, violent crimes, social crimes, economic crimes, whatsoever, you know, all that. And during this uh, period of two decades journey, I have come to certain conclusions, certain findings, and propounded a new concept, new crime theory, which I would like to share with you and hope that on the basis of that, uh, you will find something more to fight criminality at various levels here wherever you are working. Now, the today's topic uh, may have been explained in just one line, but it is such a vast subject that uh, even 10 lectures would be insufficient to explain the concept. But still, I would like to complete the topic within the stipulated time. And in the process, if uh, I may sound incoherent somewhere, that would be only because of the fact that I have to combine three different subjects, vast subjects, in just uh, 45 minutes. Now, the first part of the chapter is, first part of the lecture is understanding crime. And when we talk about crime, I am not talking about the legal definitions as given by our legislators. It is about the processes, the processual approach, you may call it, as to why people become criminals. Now, for the last about 400 years, a lot of research work has been going on. A lot of eminent people, intellectual people, who those who spend their entire lives in, in trying to unearth the factors which lead a man to criminality. They spend their entire lives. But the fact remains that till today, no theory, no concept, no work has been able to explain the criminality in totality. Otherwise, jails and prisons all across the globe would not have been overflowing with criminals. The fact is that as of today, more than 9.5 million people are in different prisons all across the globe. And there are millions and millions of others who, have, who may have spent their uh, time in the jails or who, have, who may have been acquitted for want of no evidence. <coughs> now, this was about the f first part of it. As I said that uh, for the last 400 years this effort is going on. During this uh, 400 year period, we found answers to many, many deadly diseases. <coughs> we found answers for plague, for cholera, for tuberculosis. We are about to find answers for cancer and even AIDS. 
but till today we have not been able to find whether there is a criminal gene or not and if it is there from where it functions in which part of the body it is situated and from where it functions that's that was the, uh, about the first part of the lecture the second part is about the behavior therapies which may be implied to increase the behavior deficits the desirable behaviors and to decrease the undesirable behaviors are the behavior excesses that will be the second part of the uh, presentation and the third part is the new pathway new method which we are implying and which uh, i would like to share with you now coming to the first part basically you see there are two important debates going on for the last several centuries <coughs> the first debate is the difference between the human beings and the animals animals are the primates which was an effort to explain the violent crimes or the sexual crimes and to some extent some other crimes as well and the second and which is more important the locus of our actions from where our actions originate as i said but whatever we do why we do the first debate is affected uh, that that is influenced by the charles darwin's uh, famous theory of evolution of man uh, which which says that since uh, human beings and animals they have evolved from the same ancestry some of the animal instincts they are still left in some some people which get reflected in violent crimes committed by them as you witnessed in the daily rape incident just now this debate is called the difference in degree debate the be, the the people working on this uh, theory or this concept they believe that uh, there is a difference uh, between the animals and the human beings but that that difference is only in degrees basically they they are from the same ancestry they belong to the same kind uh, same uh, same uh, uh, variety maybe at some point of time the human being or the human mind attained a certain critical state after the after which as per them it uh, uh, it went manifold and the animal kingdom remained the same but uh, the, they are, they belong to the uh, same same kind of uh, uh, same kind of uh, variety the second debate the second part of uh, uh, theorists who belong to this uh, school of thought which has come now in later stages uh, this is led by various neurobiologists who say that no the difference between the animals and the human beings is not of degree it is difference of kind the human beings are all together different species and this difference is only because of the fact that human beings have a conceptual thinking part while the animals can have only perceptual thinking human beings have conceptual thinking part as well they can think of the things which may not exist and it is that ability of the human beings which makes them different from the animals now as for them the human mind or the human brain can't be explained just an organic part of the body in terms of physics chemistry or biology alone it needs something more to explain his consciousness his urges his internal functionings of the brain now what was that more which they failed to explain which i would be touching in today's presentation and which as per my understanding is the most critical part in understanding criminality <coughs> the second debate which was earlier called as the nature versus nurture debate no it has been taken a step ahead no it is because it is being called as the determinism debate as to what factors determine our behavior there are three type of thinkers in this uh, school of thought they are situationists those who believe that it is the situations which make a man criminal then there are uh, dispositionists those who believe that situations are okay 
but there are certain internal functions of the human being his free will his way of thinking which can be taken into account and for which he, he should be held responsible for all his actions the third part is they are called the interactionists those who believe that both situations as well as the dispositions internal functions of the human being his genetic endowments his way of thinking that is also important and that that should also be taken into account so because of these two debates uh, about four schools of thought have come up uh, in the field of criminology the classical the neo classical the critical criminology and the positivist school and under these schools of thought various uh, about three dozen theories have been propounded to explain various sorts of criminality i will not go into those details you pick up any book of criminology and you will find all those theories the dry theory the uh, biochemistry the uh, social uh, sociological criminology the Marxist criminology, you will find number of those theories, I will not touch. What I am going to explain today, you will not find in any book of criminology, the mainstream, mainstream book of criminology. Now, whichever theory you may take, whichever school of thought you may belong to, ultimately, they all lead to this man. You need not study about the his school building or the size of his playground or the length and breadth of a particular road to find as to why he committed a crime, particular crime. Ultimately, it is the individual and he comes before you in different forms. He can be a terrorist, he can be a rapist, he can be a drug peddler, he can be a financial criminal, he can be anybody. If you ask this man as to why, despite having the knowledge that his activities can land him into trouble, why he committed these acts, perhaps he may not be having the answers. Those have answers have to be found by the criminologists and people like you. As to why, why he is forcing, uh, he is being forced to commit a particular type of crime. By the theory of elimination, we will go on eliminating all those body parts which are not responsible for his behavior. Now, if he has shot at somebody, if he has stabbed somebody, you need not study about his hands, the composition of his hands, the size of his hands. Previously, it was thought that uh, the body composition or body morphology or uh, the, hand, the size of the hands, etc., these determined criminal behavior. On the basis of that, you could find out as to what set of people uh, what sort of person he is, but now, now that, that concept has been discarded. We have to find from where the command to shoot or to stab somebody came. Similarly, if he has uh, committed some financial crime just to sa satiate his uh, hunger, the command to commit that particular, particular crime came from his brain. So we will directly go to that part of the body from where the origin of the behavior takes place. It is the human brain. Now before going to as to what is the brain, I will uh, say something about the brain. That the brain is not a one of body organ just like your liver or your heart or your uh, pancreas which you can study as a single organ. It is composed of perhaps uh, thousands and thousands of uh, mini brains those who have the capacity to take their decisions on their own. Secondly, brain comp comprises of, of, about uh, 100 billion neurons and 1000 trillion connections between them. So see how much uh, is the wiring or the cable in the human brain. Now 90% of this brain is meant for body maintenance. So we need not go into that part of the body. We go into that 10% which uh, which is responsible for our behavior. This 10% is also not a small thing. <coughs> it uh, comprises of about uh, 15 to 33 billion neurons. So it is, it is uh, that part of the brain which, is, which we need to study. Before I go into the, uh, into the further functioning of the brain, let me give you two examples. Let us uh, suppose 
that I am standing here, some friend of mine is coming from this table. He wants to make a fun of me. On the staircase itself, he starts shouting at me, he starts abusing me. I have not seen him, I have not seen his face. What expression he has. Now after hearing those sounds, after hearing those abusive words, which enter through my ears, I immediately get angry. Now that, that hearing senses, they are connected to some part of the brain, a particular part of the brain. So, that anger which, is, uh, which has arisen because of the stimuli, that stimuli is the uh, obscene words uttered by him. I get angry. Now once he enters the room, he is laughing, he comes and hugs me. I was angry. Now which, which particular behavior now I have to display? Whether I have to still display my anger or I have to now display some other. Because now I have seen through my eyes that his uh, behavior is altogether different. Now these eyes are connected with the 200 million sensors in this occipital region of the brain. So there is a there is a competition between two regions of the brain. One is that which is connected with the ears, the other is which is connected with the eyes. Now who is to take the final call? Whether that sub part of the brain which is connected with ears, that will determine as to which particular behavior I have to display or that part of the brain with which my eyes are connected, that will... Now if it is a competition between the two, who, who is the deciding factor then? Then say from to, to whom this matter has to be referred? Is there any arbitrator, a judge, who will decide that in, in case of such a, uh, such a contradiction between two subcenters of the brain, this particular behavior is to be displayed now. That is one part of it. That means there is some supercenter of the brain which, which takes the final call, which decides that which particular behavior I have to display. Because the behaviors say, that I can't display two antagonistic behaviors at the same time. Let us take another example. That uh, once the function is over, I'm sure Mr. Vaughan has organized some tea in the ground floor. There may be three, four items lying on the table. Once you enter the room, your eyes uh, get the glimpse of those uh, three, four items. You want to pick up only two items. Now how you will decide as to which particular two items you have to pick up? Because the signal is entering through those 200 million uh, sensors to your that particular part of the brain where the size is connected. Is it the decision of a single neuron? Or is it the decision of those 200 million neurons who have to collectively decide as to which particular two items I am going to pick up? Or is it by majority vote? And if it is by majority vote, then who is the counting agent? Who is the speaker? Who will decide that, okay, 100 million are saying that, okay, we will take Smosa, another 50 million are saying that we will take Lavda more. So who is the deciding factor? So this is the functioning of the neuron, about which uh, even the scientists uh, don't know much, and about which I will be coming now, just now. So this is the neuron, the central uh, part of the presentation. Which, which as per my thinking is the deciding factor on whose behavior my behavior depends. Once the signal goes to it through the five sensory organs, every human, uh, normal human being has got five sensory organs. Once the signal goes to this neuron, now this is the neuron. Uh, these are small filaments, uh, These small filaments, working, extruding out of the neuron, these are called dendrites. Through dendrites, the signal goes to the central part of the neuron. The central part, this is the central part. A lot of activity takes place within this central part, which determines our behavior. Within this central part, this, this is called soma, within this central part, we have the nucleus. Within the nucleus, we have the chromosomes. Within those chromosomes, we have the genes. And within those genes, 
we have four types of nucleotides adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine. The arrangement of these uh, four types of nucleotides, this is called our genetic code, which we inherit from our parents. Maybe